Obviously, it goes without saying that the Goblet of Fire is one of the most important magical artifacts in the Harry Potter series. Like, they named an entire book after it. Even though it loses all importance after the first act of that book. I don't understand why they didn't just call it Harry Potter and the Triwizard Tournament, but that just sounds wrong, so maybe Rowling was right. However, something she glossed over was who made the Goblet of Fire. Because did you know, it's the only Harry Potter book where we don't know who made the title. Thing. The Philosopher's Stone was made by Nicholas Flamel, the Chamber of Secrets by Salazar Sliverin, the Prisoner of Azkaban being Sirius Black was made by his parents, I guess. The Order of the Phoenix was founded by Dumbledore, the Half-Blood Prince was made by Tobias Snape and Eileen Prince making Snape the Half-Blood Prince. The Deathly Hallows were made by the Peverell Brothers, but the Goblet of Fire? I guess we'll never know. Except I've totally worked out who made it, and that's why I'm making this video. I think the most important information we have when it comes to the creation of the Goblet of Fire is chapter 12 from the Goblet of Fire. Someone needs to count how many times I say Goblet of Fire this video because I'm only like a minute in and I feel like I've already said it like 10 times. Anyway, in chapter 12, Dumbledore reveals the Triwizard Tournament was first established some 700 years ago. Meaning since this specific story takes place in 1994 and presumably the Cup of Flames has been used in each of the Triwizard Tournaments, it must have also been built some 700 years ago. Specifically, we can't 100% know the date for sure because some 700 years ago is about as vague as it gets, but we can place a well-educated guess. You see, we know before the Triwizard Tournament of 1994, the event had not been held for over a century, meaning the tournament before this one must have been held before 1894. Add this to the fact that before then, the schools took it in turns to host the tournament once every five years. We also know, according to the Bobatons Pottermore page, there have been at least 124 tournaments before this most recent Hogwarts victory. 62 going to Bobaton and 62 going to Hogwarts. Meaning there have been at least 124 times 5. 620 years of this tournament taking place before it got abandoned in 1894-ish. Well, 1894 minus 620 equals 1274, and surely Durmstrang have won a few too, right? But to me, that gives some sufficient evidence that when Dumbledore said some 700 years ago, he meant on the high end of 700 years, maybe even nearly 800. Specifically, I'm guessing early to mid 13th century, I don't know, like 1230s to the 1250s-ish era. I mean, the Goblet of Fire must have been built by someone around that time for it to be ready for the first competition. And yes, technically there is an argument that it could have been built specifically for this competition this year, but I'm choosing to disagree with this purely because if that was the case, why did Dumbledore need to create the age line around it to stop people from participating? Like, surely the age limit would have been built into it, and, well, that would have stopped Harry from having to participate, so maybe that would have been a good idea. As Fred Weasley specifically says, an age line? Well, that should be fooled by an aging potion, shouldn't it? And once your name's in the goblet, you're laughing. It can't tell whether you're 17 or not. Like, if, I don't know, Dumbledore built it specifically for this competition, don't you think telling someone's age would be an important feature of it? And on that topic, let's talk about the features of the Goblet of Fire, because as you all know, it acts as an impartial judge to choose the champions for the Triwizard Tournament. And while, to my understanding, it must have some sort of sentient ability to analyze the character and personality of the entrance, looking for some specific attraction. Tribute. You know, it's kind of like the sorting hat, but a cup. And actually, since they're similar, and because we know a lot more about the sorting hat being that legend has it, it once belonged to one of the four founders, Godric Gryffindor, and that it was jointly enchanted by all of the four founders to ensure that students would be sorted into their eponymous houses, which would be selected according to each founder's particular preferences in students. I think it would make a lot of sense to assume that whoever made the Goblet of Fire used similar enchantments to select champions based on what they thought made them worthy. And considering that the four Hogwarts founders were remembered as the four greatest witches and wizards of the age. I think it was clearly made by a very powerful witch or wizard. This would not have been simple to create. Meaning we're looking for a powerful wizard from the early to mid 13th century, which is a very tricky challenge because I can't name one wizard who's specifically said to be from 1200s. There are three powerful wizards that were surely from that time that instantly spring to mind. Three brothers, specifically. We know they're powerful because, well, they made the Deathly Hallows. And as Dumbledore says, the Peverell brothers were simply gifted, dangerous wizards. The only thing is, we don't know the specific dates of when they were alive. You see, in the books, the only real clue we get for a time frame of when the Peverell brothers were around is from the description of Ignotus Peverell's grave, which is described to be extremely old 
weathered so that Harry could hardly make out the name, which reveals that it was a long time ago. What a revelation! In the films, the grave specifically says Ignotus lived from 1214 to 1292. The only thing is, I don't think J.K. Rowling specifically told the prop designer, Ooh, make sure to write these specific dates on Ignotus Peverell's grave, please. I mean, those are just two completely random dates that someone thought would look good on the gravestone, so. I'm choosing to ignore it, and quite frankly, I'm only bringing it up so that no one can use it as evidence to rebuttal this theory, so. There. I mentioned it. It's not right. It's wrong. Because if you dig deep enough, we actually get some pretty specific dates from J.K. Rowling herself. Firstly, in the Tales of Beetle the Bob, the book that Dumbledore gave to Hermione to learn the story of the three brothers, Dumbledore describes Beetle as somewhat out of step with his times in preaching a message of brotherly love for muggles, the persecution of witches and wizards was gathering pace all over Europe in the early 15th century. Meaning the book that tells the story of the three brothers was written after the 1400s, meaning they all must have been dead by then, probably for a while if it's considered a tale, which I think's a good starting point. But the real time frame comes to play if you get scavenging through Pottermore, specifically J.K. Rowling's writings on the Potter family. Because if you read it, you'll learn a thing or two about the 12th century wizard Linfred of Stinchcombe. 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 Whom interestingly the Potter family descends from because his nickname was the Potterer, which eventually became Potter and then that became his surname and of course Harry's surname and yeah, it's all a big thing. But most importantly for this video, it reveals that his eldest son married a beautiful young witch of the name of Yolanthi Peverell, the granddaughter of Ignotus. Peverell. Therefore, using a bit of logic, Ignotus Peverell's son would also have been born in the 12th century. Probably, if we're assuming he's similar age to Linfred of Stitchcombe. Meaning Ignotus would be a bit older than that and presumably born in the early 1100s. And therefore, being the youngest and the last to die of the three brothers, we can safely say that none of the three brothers built the Goblet of Fire in the early to mid 1200s. However, his granddaughter Yolanthi Potter and her husband would have had to have been born like half a century later, probably towards the end of the 12th century. I mean, they'd have been going through school, presumably Hogwarts in the early 1200s, and coming into the height of their power in the early to mid 13th century. And I think we've just found two prime candidates for the creator of the Goblet of Fire. Hardwin and Yolanthi Potter, Harry's great, 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 grandparents. And yeah, it's true, they are recent descendants of some powerful wizards, which while not necessarily meaning they're powerful themselves, works in their favor. And the timelines fit up nicely, but that isn't everything. I need a good reason, and I think I found one. Being that I believe Yolanthi Potter was teaching at Hogwarts at around the time of the first Triwizard Tournament. How did we get here? Okay, stick with me because I will get to that, but first I need to talk about her father-in-law, Linfred of Stitchcombe. To return back to J.K. Rowling's article on the Potters, he's described as a vague, absent-minded fellow whose muggle neighbors often called upon for his medal, medicine, medicine, medicinal services. None of them realized that Linfred's wonderful cures for pox and ag, 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 ague were magical. They all thought him a harmless and lovable chap pottering about in his garden with all his funny plants. Which is interesting, because if you've read Tales of Beetle the Bard, specifically the first tale, The Wizard and the Hopping Pot, it's about a kindly old wizard who used his magic generously and wisely for the benefit of his neighbors. Rather than reveal the true source of his power, he pretended that his potions, charms, and antidotes sprang ready-made from the little cauldron he called his lucky cooking pot. Like, that's a little weird. Those stories are basically exactly the same. Why would JK Rowling write the same story twice? And yeah, there are a few minor differences, but this is also a tale. But like, it's not like Beetle the Bard to base his tales off true stories and change a few details. Oh wait. Okay, maybe, but Linfred of Stitchcomb wasn't as famous as the Peverell brothers. How would Beetle even know this story? Except he would totally know this story because the Peverell family and the Potter family marry into each other and... They become the same family. Like, Linfred of Stitchcombe is the grandfather of Ignotus Peverell's great-grandchildren. So you'd think if he knows one story from this family, he must know someone from that family telling him the stories. And, well, why wouldn't they tell him this other one about Linfred helping the muggles on his street? And theory inside of a theory... What if Beetle the Bard was a descendant of the Potters? And maybe all the tales are about his ancestors. I don't know, that's besides the point, being that the tale of the Wizard and the Hopping Pot is 100% about Linfred and Hardwin Potter. Even for a tale where the details of the story have clearly been changed here and there, the resemblance is uncanny. For those of you who are unfamiliar with the story, it's basically about this kind father who helped sick muggles in his street by producing potions, 
Lin Fred. Well, he dies, and his son Hardwin refuses to help the Muggles his father helped, because he's one of those. But his father, knowing this would happen, cursed the pot top around his house until he had a change of heart. Which is exactly what happened in both stories! The Potters continued to marry their neighbours, occasionally Muggles, and to live in the west of England for several generations, each one adding to the family coffers by their hard work and, it must be said, by the quiet brand of ingenuity that had characterised their forebear, Linfred. Which brings me back to the original point that I've drifted miles away from. Being that Yolanthi teaches at Hogwarts. Because of course the key detail to the story was that the son was still living with, or at least near to his father, and didn't seem to have a family of his own. While the idea of him living with or near his father fits with the whole Potter's story because presumably that's where they procure the potions they made their fortune from. But not having family around? Well, that just doesn't work. Unless there's a good reason why he has no family around. Like, what if his wife and kids were all at some boarding school up in Scotland? That would provide a good reason why he has no family around. We know for a fact that all professors at Hogwarts also live there, so it all fits up. Especially when you consider the limited amount of jobs in the wizarding world. Like, you either work for the ministry in some capacity, you teach at Hogwarts, or become like a professional Quidditch player or something. And what, in terms of being a professional Quidditch player, that wasn't a thing in the 13th century at least according to Quidditch throughout the ages. And while, yes, working at the Ministry is technically an option, the Pottermore article specifically mentions occasionally a Potter made it all the way to London. Stating by name each of the Potters that did so, but Yolanthi isn't mentioned. And I'm sorry, but what other job in the Wizarding World would require you to be away from home most of the time? Please, comment now. Oh, you, you can't think of something? That's a real shame, isn't it? And if I'm right about the tale being about Linford and Hardwin Potter, which I am sure I am because the story is the same as the Potter family history, this would provide just the perfect solution to where the Sun's family are during this tale. And if Yolanthi was in fact a powerful witch teaching at Hogwarts around the time of the Triwizard Tournament, she'd be in the right place at the right time. And who's to say she wouldn't be the one who was assigned to create the Goblet of Fire? <laughs> Honestly, it's so late right now and I'm so tired, so make sure to subscribe to my channel and watch another video and social medias and merch and all that. Thanks for watching and I'll see you guys next time. Give a like for my efforts, if anything.